The entirety of Ulthuan had sank into the sea with the unraveling of the vortex, and in its demise it released the eight winds of magic. The wind of Gur sails far east and empowers the green slaughterer Grimgor Ironhide and spurs him on a massive march that would swallow a majority of the eastern reaches. Meanwhile, Manfred von Karstein plots with the newly revived Nagash to put an end to the chaos invasion, but the ancient necromancer punishes Manfred for his ever conniving mind. Nagash ventures south instead to wake an ancient power entombed beneath the sands. Welcome to our latest episode on the end times of Warhammer Fantasy, where we will cover Grimgor's Great War and the return of Nagash. Grimgor had his orcs, but who are you going to take on your war? How about a powerful alliance of heroes backed up by behemoths? That's the deal with today's sponsor, Call of Dragons. It's a 4x strategy game with MMORPG elements in which you battle for domination with alliances of other players, but you'll also find beasts of nature in your path, and we recommend you find a way to defeat them. Why? Because hostile behemoths with their powerful abilities can be captured and added to your ranks to give you a giant advantage in the ongoing wars. There are 8 behemoths in all to find and tame, and we recommend using dragon scale armor to tank its powerful attacks while your damage dealers move in for the kill. Each behemoth is unique, but by watching their patterns and considering what units to use, we know you'll find a way to make their power your own. Once you have your new allies, take them into the magical world of discovery and battle, enjoying tactical RTS combat with PvP, PvE and huge alliance-on-alliance -alliance wars. You can play for free on PC or mobile, and to get started, get the game via our link in the description or the QR code on screen. Then use our code CODMONSTER to grab some special rewards inside the game. Go become a master of behemoths and indeed a master of strategy in Call of Dragons. A grin split Grimgore's grotesque features as he recalled how the Stunties had wailed as he'd torn down their city of pillars and pits, freed their slaves, and toppled their statues. That'd teach them to break their staves on his hide. That'd teach them to try to make Grimgore a slave. The grin faded, and the old anger came back, hotter and fiercer than any stunty fire pit. Grimgore Ironhide, recalling his true origins. Before Grimgor was recognized as the most infamous greenskin warlord, he was one among the thousands of slaves serving the ruthless Chaos Dwarfs, a forgotten throng of mountain men steeped in the horrors of the first Chaos incursion when the ancient Polar Gates fell. Forced to survive after being cut off from their Dwarven allies in the west, the ancient wars of Chaos changed them in dreadful ways. The Chaos Dwarfs abandoned the traditional ancestor gods of their kin, and embrace the bull-like minor chaos god Hashut, and with it the greed, the tyranny, and the demonic fire that Hashut demanded in worship. In massive, sleepless factories spewing black smoke above the dark lands, the chaos dwarves force thousands of goblins and orcs into hard labor. From this dismal, hopeless reality, Grimgor would emerge as one of the first black orcs, and find the freedom to do what he loved most wage glorious war. Where then do they come from, these iron savages who frighten other orcs into awestruck obedience, these black orcs? That is a grim tale best suited for long winter nights, but I will impart the substance of it. Long ago, the fell chaos kindred of the dwarves needed a steady source of reliable troops. The green skin races that they had to deal with at the time, they deemed less than adequate. So using their sorcery and a carefully applied breeding program, they set about creating a new strain of orc. They sought to make them stronger, hardier, and more intelligent, that they could better carry out the will of the Chaos Dwarves. They succeeded far beyond their expectations and desires. Voldemar, Scholar of Nuln The ill-fated experiment of the Chaos Dwarves to create better slaves succeeded only in making perfect leaders for the enslaved to rise up and break the shackles that bound them to their cruel masters. Only by the betrayal of the treacherous hobgoblins were the Chaos Dwarfs spared total destruction at the axes of the Black Orcs, and once the rebellion had allowed countless slaves to escape, the Dwarfs swiftly re-established control over their mines, armories and factories. Emerging with his life, along with a contingent of exhausted and hungry Black Orc bodyguards, known as the Immortals, 
Grimgor wasted no time marching north to the World's Edge Mountains to take over tribes of greenskins and carve out a small empire for himself. Through battles with Kislev, Skaven and the Dwarfs, Grimgor established himself as the Green Slaughterer and Da Alpha Orc. That's right, I ain't never not won before, but I still ain't been beat. Grimgor after fighting the Northmen of Vardek Krom. During the early years of the Chaos invasion into Kislev, Grimgor eventually suffered an embarrassing defeat at the hands of Vardek Krom. In the aftermath and his enraged march east, his goal was to redeem himself in the eyes of the green-skin god of brutal cunning Gork. Rampaging east, Grimgor's boys encountered and annihilated the Necksnapper tribe in the World's Edge Mountains. The survivors of the tribe quickly pledged allegiance to the Green Slaughterer, further swelling Grimgor's numbers. Pushing even further east, the Hobgoblin tribes of the Eastern Steppes were next to succumb to the massive tide of Greenskins. The more Grimgor conquered, the enormity of his already massive army continued to grow. Orcs poured in from all over the world to take part in the glorious war, and just as Grimgor's power and authority seemed to peak, his body was infused with the wind of beasts as the far-off vortex collapsed. Invigorated as the incarnate of Gur, the war boss dared to confront the tyrant of the Ogre Kingdoms, Greasus Goldtooth. By his formal title, Trade Lord Greasus Tribe Stealer Drake Crush Gate Crusher Horde Master Goldtooth the Shockingly Obese, the Ogre Tyrant, was a perfect challenge for Grimgor to prove himself as the best. Claiming that he was too rich to walk, Greasus' living throne of goblins carried the unbelievably fat warlord to Grimgor. Terribly vain, the ogre would not submit to Grimgor easily. However, Grimgor secured the support of the ogre kingdoms by clubbing Goldtooth's head in with his own scepter. Through this display, the ogres believed Grimgor was the living avatar of the ever-hungering Great Maw a great crater created in ancient times that bore innumerable spikes to give the illusion of a gaping toothy mouth. Seeing Grimgor's insatiable hunger for war and glory, the Black Orc warboss commanded the following of the ogres and continued his terrible warpath even further east to the verdant lands of Cathay. As he lay siege to the Empire of Cathay, he attracted the attention of the prophet of the greenskin gods, Wurzag ud Ura Zahuba. Wurzag is beholden to no tribe nor lord, only the whisperings of the green-skinned gods in his adult mind. Wurzag. It was Wurzag's dream to find the one great warboss that would conquer the world by claiming both the twin gods Gork of brutal cunning and Mork of cunning brutality. By the light of the fire in each encampment he visited in the east, Wurzag performed shamanistic dances in search of clear signs of the orc that would embody the will of both gods. After weeks of pondering visions, the prophet had realized that the war boss he sought would come to him not in one form, but two, the Fist of Gork and the Hand of Mork. Deeming Grimgor Ironhide the Fist of Gork, he approached the Black Orc war boss as the destruction of Cathay and Nippon were certain. Initially wanting to split Wurzag's shamanistic mask in half with his axe, Grimgor allegedly received a flick on the noggin from Gork himself and decided that Wurzag was too valuable to kill. This value would be swiftly proven as the Greenskin Horde turned west and marched towards the very place that made Grimgor into a Black Orc, the Dark Lands of the Chaos Dwarfs. There's in my way and I want him gone! Gork wants me somewhere else, and I intend to go there. But that ain't here, so go blast him. Yes, oh mighty git, Wurzak squawked, shaking his staff. And stop calling me a git, Grimgor roared. The Green Slaughterer and the Great Green Prophet. Much like when Grimgor first became a Black Orc, his bloody and efficient rise to supremacy inspired the Chaos Dwarf's slaves to stage a massive revolt. With the combined enormity of Grimgor's horde and the number of enslaved greenskins, the Chaos Dwarf Empire was overrun once the horde had liberated the slave pits and mines. Eager to take the fight to their sadistic masters, the green tide swallowed the dark lands and shattered all remaining dwarf holds. With Cathay, Nippon and the Chaos Dwarfs trampled beneath his boot, Grimgor ascends his throne as the greatest conqueror to ever live. 
Then, just as he settled into the glory of victory, he and all of his warriors were suddenly teleported by Gork to partake in the great battle that would eventually decide the fate of the world. While the green tide ravaged the northeast realms of the world, in the dark mires of Sylvania, another was bound to the released winds of magic. Revived by the diabolical plans of vampire lord Manfred von Karstein, the infamous necromancer ripped from the vortex after his rebirth the wind of death itself, hoping to instill within him the power of a god. However, it became clear that Manfred's ritual was flawed. The sacrifice of Aliathra, who was assumed to be the daughter of the Phoenix King, Finnebar, was actually the daughter of Tyrion. Instead of granting the divine blessing of Assyrian, Nagash received the curse of Cain, which sapped Nagash short of ultimate power. Despite Manfred's failure in securing godhood for Nagash, the great necromancer rewarded Manfred for his loyalty by summoning for him a dread abyssal steed named Ashigorath and the title of Mortark. Freed to terrorize the realm once more, Nagash devised his own plan to conquer the world and become the only true god in existence. Sensing the deceit and treachery still within Manfred's mind, Nagash punished the vampire by resurrecting his sire, who would go on to stall Archon's forces in the north and aid Balthazar Gelt's Golden Bastion. Vlad von Kastein, brought to life again through necromancy, defeated Manfred in single combat, despite being weakened and unarmed. Manfred's thralls and supporters quickly turned their allegiance to the true ruler of the von Kastein bloodline, and Nagash made Vlad a Mortark before he was sent north promising to revive his beloved wife Isabella von Karstein in turn. Meanwhile, the great necromancer and Manfred travelled south to the ancient sands of Nehekara. In that dread desert, beneath the moon's pale gaze, dead men walk. They haunt the shifting dunes of the breathless, windless night, brandish weapons of bronze in mocking challenge and bitter resentment of the life they no longer possess and sometimes, in ghastly dry voices, like the rustling of sun-baked reeds, they whisper the one word they remember from life, the name of the one who cursed them to their existence, more than death but less than life. They whisper the name Nagash. Extract from Liber Necris, translated by Manfred von Karstein. The lands of Nehekara were actually the birthplace of Nagash. In ancient times, when the desert was bustling with the riches of pyramids and dynasties, Nagash was the firstborn of King Ketep and destined to serve in the Mortuary Cult, a sect of lich priests whose mission was to turn Nehekara into an immortal kingdom where kings ruled in riches evermore. Supremely talented, but also cursed with the jealousy of his brother Thutem, Nagash and a dozen acolytes of the cult seized the throne and entombed Thutep in their own father's temple. Mad with power, he perfected his necromantic arts and concocted the first Elixir of Life, the Nine Books of Nagash, and constructed a massive black pyramid for himself to rival even the Pyramid of Setra, the very king that saw the foundation of the mortuary cult. In those days, Nagash was eventually overthrown by the weary people of Nehekara, but in his grand return in the end times, Nagash hoped to reclaim his pyramid as his throne of godhood. With Manfred aligning with the vampire pirate fleet, commanded by Luthor Harkon, Nagash's invasion force made landfall in Zandri, where the great Mortis River poured into the ocean. Manfred marched south with his legions of Graveguard, Black Knights and White Knights to lay siege to the city, while Harkon's fleets occupied the port and began hailing cannon fire into it. From the sands and tombs deep beneath the desert, immortal constructs rose to send the undead back to their graves. Tomb scorpions, Ushabti guardians and sepulchral knights erupted from the earth and cleaved through the hordes, their stone armor deflecting the blades of their opponents with ease. For days a battle of attrition raged, with each conflict further draining Manfred of his ability to resurrect his fallen warriors. Eventually, and by the sheer luck that his lieutenant was able to place a well-timed blade into the back of King Behedesh, Manfred and Luthor's assault finally secured the port city from the Nehekaran defense. The vampire count could only look on as Nagash pulled the invasion all the way to Kemri, where his undead encircled the city. 
Keeping himself concealed from the front lines, Nagash persuaded the tomb kings guarding Marak, City of Hope, to his will. Through the Channel Valley they marched and amassed a gigantic spell to collapse the mountains on both sides of the valley, preventing the armies of Libaris and Resetra from coming to aid Kemri. Now make ready your weapons, my soldiers, for the time is at hand. Go forth, I command you go forth in haste and march with your king into the darkness of the tomb. Make great the name of Setra and Kemri. The darkness draws near, and there are great deeds that remain undone, enemies yet to crush, and raptures yet to rejoice in. So as it is written, so it shall be done. I, Setra, have proclaimed it, and let none dare oppose my will. Inscription on the Great Obelisk of Kemri As Nagash's armies prepared to lay siege to the greatest city of Nehekara, there was one ancient king that would stand defiant before the great necromancer's march to godhood. Revived from his tomb by the Chaos Gods, in exchange for ending the reign of Nagash, Setra the Imperishable awakened from his burial chambers and ordered his city of stone constructs to stand sentinel along the carved walls of his city. Further enraged by the betrayal of the Marak Tomb Kings, tens of thousands of Setra's Hawk Legion answered the call of their king. With regiments of Setra's legendary chariots at the ready, a battle between the two greatest undead empires the world had ever seen was preparing to take place, with the fate of the world at stake. More videos on the end times are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel and we will catch you on the next one.